Thank you all. And again, thank you all for being here. It, it is a tremendous thing. Got a bit of a ring to this, whoever. But it's a tremendous thing. Different ministries, different Bible colleges, different churches, all bound by the same truth. Christ died for us. And he has sent us with that message to the whole world. And there isn't anybody that isn't included in that. What a glorious thing. Well, let's study a little bit of history. We'll go back to doctrine in a bit, but first, let's study a little bit of history. Let's find out if we want to be reformed. That, that's the fad of the day, is to say, I'm reformed. That all faithful Bible-believing Christians are reformed Christians. Well, let's see. We'd done the two opening paragraphs. The Reformation took place roughly during the same time as the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Fundamental believers often differ dramatically in their comments concerning the Reformation. While some list it as glorious, others list it as detrimental. The truth is probably found somewhere in the middle. Okay? And credit where credit is due. Blame where blame is due. The Reformation was basically a revival of evangelical religion. Several large groups came out of Roman Catholicism in protest, creating a Protestant movement. There were some very good things which came out of the Reformation. The gospel of salvation by grace was preached where it had not been preached before. That is a good thing. Literally millions of people made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. That is a good thing. Also, the line of Bibles used by the Catholic Church was broken, and people began to return to the pure text of Scripture. They began to return to the pure text of Scripture, which is in the line to our King James Bible. That's a good thing. While these results were glorious, by the same token, the Reformers, the Protestants, discovered the gospel but never seriously adapted the Bible to some other subjects, and this created severe problems. Again, those of you who were with us yesterday, remember we said the great temptation for preachers is not to be able to admit you were wrong, and this was a brand new movement, and the preachers weren't trained. And man, they really needed an extra dose of humility and often didn't have it. So they ran with what they ran with, unable to come to grips with the fact they still did not know so much and needed to learn so much. These problems developed to the point that in the turmoil of the times, Reformation believers put some of their own brothers and sisters in Christ to death for not belonging to the state churches. They were frightened. They believed you had to have a state church to survive the Catholic armies and Catholic warfare. They believed you had to have submission to a, a united church state to survive. The blank is Reformation believers put some of their own brothers and sisters in Christ to death for not belonging to the state churches. Rather than trust Christ, they trusted the idea of a state church to survive in difficult times. And they were so frightened that in order to maintain the strength of the state church, they literally put people to death who did not believe in a state church because of their Bible convictions. That was a horrible, awful, terrible mistake that stems back to a, not, a, a lack of willingness to trust Christ in these difficult times. To be fair, the times were genuinely difficult. The warfare was real. The executions were real. 
The threat was real. But they picked the wrong solution to those threats. And rather than admit they ever made a mistake, actually in the next couple of generations, some start to admit that. But rather than admit at this moment they made a mistake, they end up putting brothers and sisters in Christ to death. So people say, are you reformed? You better believe I'm not. I've never one time in my life advocated putting another brother and sister in Christ to death for anything. I'm a far cry from being reformed. I can appreciate what they got right, but I certainly have a great deal of distaste for what they got wrong. Yeah. Okay. Surely it is difficult to be excited about that. There are aspects of the Reformation where they're rejoicing and others which bring condemnation. In both cases, there's much that can be learned. The Reformation refers, refers to the period of time, 16th century, when many Europeans broke from the Roman Catholic Church and formed state churches. Okay. They broke the power of Catholicism. That's a good thing, credit where credit is due. Okay. It's common for people to believe that all Christian churches are either Catholic or Protestant, yet there is another line of churches which were never a part and never came out of the Catholic Church. Baptists will emphasize they're not Protestant because they've always been independent of the Catholic Church. And, and, and for that matter, just for history's sake, there were several other groups who were never part of the Catholic Church. They were equally heretical, but just for the record, they were never part of the Catholic Church. This idea that you're Catholic or Protestant, again, is a cliche somebody came up with that hasn't studied the matter very thoroughly. There had always been independent churches and regional groups of churches which had defied Roman Catholic control. However, the Reformation saw new church organizations take the official role of the state church, a role formerly reserved for Roman Catholicism. Roman number one, you can't tell the story of the Reformation without telling the story of Martin Luther. He is overwhelmingly the major figure of the Reformation. The story of the Reformation is intertwined with the life of Martin Luther. As a young man, Luther lived a wild life, one that he knew was in rebellion to God. One day during a violent storm, Luther promised God he would serve him if God spared his life. God did. After the story, Luther began to study to be a monk. Luther tried many ways within the Roman Catholic Church to serve God. He devoted hours and hours to good works, but constantly felt he had failed to gain peace with God. He devoted himself to confessing sin to the point that he became obsessed in the record keeping and confessing of his sins. Confession, though, did not bring him peace. In fact, in a monastery, each priest was assigned to be the confessor of an, another priest. No one wanted to be Luther's confessor because he would break his day down in five-minute periods of time confessing the sin for each five minutes. At four o'clock, it was lazy. 4.05, he was still lazy. At 4.10, he was still lazy. Nobody wanted to be Luther's confessor because he would take several hours every day confessing his sin. One of them eventually told him either quit confessing so much or get some more interesting sins. Well, that didn't bring him peace. He took pilgrimages, but they did not bring him any peace. He went through a period in which he would literally beat himself with a whip in hopes that the pain, paying for his sin, would bring him peace. None of this, however, brought him any peace. It's only the understanding what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary which can bring peace. Luther was eventually assigned to be a teacher in a small German town of Wittenberg. There, while teaching the book of Habakkuk, he became confused about the little phrase, the just shall live by faith. Since that phrase is quoted in three New Testament books, Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews, he began to study those books. This study inevitably, inevitably led Luther into the biblical teaching of justification by faith. Luther came to an understanding of this and trusted Christ as his personal savior. He began to teach justification by faith 
both in college classes and in the Wittenberg church. Week after week, Luther preached this message, and large groups of people came to hear it. They didn't actually have a pastor in the church. They would use university professors to preach. Whenever Luther had a turn, he would preach that there was hope in what, for you in what Jesus did for you on the cross of Calvary. And whenever Luther was scheduled to preach, people flocked to come. Because any, anybody else that spoke, the message was pretty much you can't be good enough to satisfy God. When Luther spoke, there was hope. Christ had died for you. He's so confused. He does his famous 95 theses, and if you read them, almost all of them are misunderstandings of the Bible. But with all the foolishness, there was this. Jesus died for you and paid for your sin on the cross. And even in the middle of his foolish ideas and the Catholic ideas, that message was saving people. Today, just as then, there are people whose hearts are hungry for a message that offers them some consolation. Obviously, there are a great many people who are hostile toward the gospel. If Christians will talk about the gospel often enough, it soon becomes clear that many people in the world have souls which are hungry and open to hear the truth. The indulgence controversy. The Roman Catholic Church taught that when people sinned, they needed to confess their sins and ask for forgiveness from a priest. The priest would assign a penance, a type of good work, which was done to bring about God's forgiveness. They called this repentance. Popes began to claim they had the power to cancel a person's penance by selling them an indulgence. This made it possible for a person to buy his way out of having to do good works. So if you had committed adultery, instead of being assigned all these good works to do to make up for it, you could just pay the right fee and be forgiven. They began to use this as a major fundraiser. Understanding that the love of money is the root of all evil exposes the roots of every plan of salvation by works. This new indulgence program prompted salesmen to bid for the job of selling indulgences. This allowed them to receive a percentage of what they sold. Soon, indulgent salesmen were competing with one another uh, in the sale of this unique type of insurance policy. This is so hypocritical that many people, including priests, began to criticize the selling of indulgences. During Luther's time, the family told people they could buy indulgences for family members who had passed away. Here's a deal for you. Your mother, your beloved grandparents are in uh, paying for their sin in the afterlife before they can go on to heaven. But if you just pay the right fee, they can be released from purgatory and go to heaven today. What would you pay to let grandma go to heaven today? And there were some even all-purpose indulgences. You pay a high enough fee, you're covered forever. What would you pay to be covered forever? And they've got these salesmen going out all over Europe selling these indulgences. It's getting worse and worse. According to teaching Roman Catholicism, there were people in purgatory paying the penalty for any sins they not paid for on earth. By purchasing an indulgence for them, family members of the deceased could reduce their time in purgatory. Or if they paid it, paid enough, even eliminate it altogether. I mean, you could get grandma out of the fires of purgatory today and in heaven. For people who truly believed in this, no sacrifice was too great. Certainly freeing loved ones from purgatories worth selling the family farm or any other financial sacrifice. This had tremendous power because of the guilt it could generate. An indulgence salesman named Tetzel came to Wittenberg selling indulgences. In opposition to this teaching, Luther wrote out 95 points attacking not only indulgences, but also other church abuses, and countering this with the teaching 
of justification by faith. This was a good thing. Credit where credit is due. And now foolish people, they was, anybody teaches salvation by faith and is reformed. Because that's what Luther did. Who gave you the power to make that up? Salvation by faith is in the Bible. Luther happened to discover it. I'm glad. I'm glad for anybody that got saved through his preaching of it. But salvation by faith is not a doctrine unique to Martin Luther. He happened to stumble across it, thank God. It's from the Bible. The authority is in the Bible. Okay. Well, each point of his 95 points was called a thesis. On October 31, 1517, often called the birthday of the Reformation, Luther nailed these points to the church door in Wittenberg. This may have been the end of the story. Had it not been for the invention of the printing press, somebody took them down off the church door and started printing copies. The copies went all over Germany and attracted enough attention they get translated into other languages and they go all over Europe. Using the newly invented printing press, Luther's 95 theses were copied by the thousands distributed throughout Germany. Luther quickly became a spokesman throughout Germany and then throughout Europe against the indulgences and for justification by faith. That is good. He deserves credit and praise for that. The role of Luther during the Reformation was that of a mixed character who could be debated as both a hero and a villain. He was actually no friend to the independent churches teaching the gospel because he justified their persecution. By the same token, he did discover salvation by faith. And he too suffered tremendous persecution to bring the gospel to people. At first, Luther wanted to remain in the Roman Catholic Church. But he was eventually excommunicated by the Pope. One of Luther's supporters, a German prince, kidnapped him and hid him in a castle for Luther's own safety. Luther believed that everyone should read and study the Bible for himself. Again, credit for that. This opposed Catholicism at the time, and still taught today in some Latin countries, that's a sin for anyone other than a member of the Catholic clergy to read the Bible. The Latin Bible of Luther's day could not be understood by the common man. So Luther translated the Bible into German. And credit for that. Okay. To this day, the Lutheran translation is the basis for the proper sound Bible translation in Germany, in the German language. Credit for that. Okay. Today, there is a great debate over the text of scripture used to produce a Bible translation. Two basic families of old manuscripts which differ dramatically. This same debate concerning which accurately preserved the word of God existed in Luther's day. Luther translated, on this occasion, the New Testament, later the entire Bible, from the same family of Hebrew and Greek manuscripts as was used in the translation of today's King James Bible. Luther's act of translating the scriptures into the common language was highly controversial. Even today, there are people who refuse to read the scriptures in fear of God's judgment. However, Luther began to urge people to read, study, and accept the Bible for themselves. He did a great thing. With this, he was rightly upholding the scriptural concept of the priesthood of all believers. Again, credit where credit's due. This is good. A distinctly evangelical church began to develop in Germany around the teaching of Martin Luther. Many German princes adopted Lutherism as a state church for their region and replaced Roman Catholicism. They still had a state church. The only difference is which state church is it? Soon the strife between Lutherans and Roman Catholics was very great, often breaking out into violence. While Luther understood many independent Bible truths, he still maintained some heretical Catholic doctrine. He did not understand the Bible truth of the independent church any better than Roman Catholics did. 
In fact, independent Bible-believing churches were persecuted by both Luther and all Catholic state churches. For that, he deserves blame, and a great deal of it. Lutheranism offered freedom from Catholicism, but not freedom from the state church. Independent preachers continued to be considered outlaws. All independent churches in Germany soon began to be called Anabaptist churches, whether or not they were Baptistic, in agreement with the six Baptist distinctives and their beliefs. The Peasants' Revolt. Luther's original call to spiritual liberty and freedom from Catholicism met with a highly receptive audience in Germany. Many Germans took his ideas even farther to their logical conclusions of economic freedom, complete religious liberty, and even political freedoms. These freedoms are logical conclusions because the scripture reveals that God had given to each man the freedom to choose his beliefs. The freedom to choose his beliefs. If God lives, pe leaves people free, what right does government have to enslave them? If God will let you decide, if God gives you free will, what right does government have to decide? what you believe. God allows each person to hear his message and decide whether or not to accept it. If people can be free about an issue as important as the gospel, why should they not be free to make economic choices? People can be free about such important issues as the Bible, uh, encouraged by God to study and read the Bible for themselves. What right does a state church have to tell them what to believe? There is a logical conclusion to all of those freedoms which comes from the preaching of the gospel. This is why there was a direct relationship between the time of the nationwide revival of the Great Awakening, that's in the United States history, and the establishment of the freest society known in the world at that time. The people were logically applying the principles of the gospel. This very application in Germany prompted many to seek the creation of a free nation. 1524, German peasants revolted against the royal princes and rulers. Many thought that Luther would side with this peasants' revolt. It's the teaching and preaching of Luther that causes the peasants' revolt. He creates it. He should have sided with it. He should have been the great voice for freedom in that setting. Had he been, how he would be remembered by history today. On the contrary, Luther denounced it and sided with the princes. The lack of a single leader widely respected throughout Germany doomed the revolt to failure. By 1525, over 100,000 uh, peasants had been killed. Sorry, over a million peasants had been killed. And um, the rest were treated much worse than they had been before. Although the peasants' revolt was a logical conclusion of this preaching of the gospel, Luther never carried his teaching that far. Some have said that if the peasants' revolt had been successful, Luther would be remembered as the George Washington of Germany. So... Are there things to give Luther credit for? Yes. Are there places where he has to take blame? Absolutely. I was given a set of Luther sermons, a number of volumes. I've read some of them. He has a whole sermon in which he preaches the importance of putting the Anabaptist to death in order to preserve the state church. In the same volume... He has sermons about salvation by faith. When I'm reading the sermons about salvation by faith, my heart rejoices. When I'm reading the sermon about putting Baptists to death, I have a very, very different reaction. Okay. Credit where credit is due. But blame where blame is due. There is enough blame to attach to Luther. 
that I cannot think of Luther as a hero. Though I'll give him credit for having done some things right. Okay. Now, the Peace of Augsburg, 14, 1546, 1555. So much fighting between Lutherans and Roman Catholics that Germany was in a virtual state of civil war. Finally, the Peace of Augsburg was reached. This agreement recognized the right of each German prince to decide whether his region would be Catholic or Lutheran. Eventually, an agreement was reached allowing the individual German citizen to decide for himself. Not what he wanted to be, whether he wanted to be Catholic or Lutheran. The Lutheran church spread into the Scandinavian countries. Denmark officially adopted Lutheran as a state church, and Denmark's influence over Norway led to the adoption of a Lutheran state church in Norway. Many of the people of Scandinavia were disillusioned by the control of the Catholic Church. Additionally, the royal families found it in their interest to break with the Pope. This was because Lutheranism did not have one central headquarters to challenge them as the Catholic Church did. This allowed the local rulers, princes, or kings far more freedom. Lutheranism, as a result, was more readily received. This did not mean the rulers trusted Christ as their savior. For many, this was purely a political decision. Soon there was a demand for change in Sweden. The Swedish king officially adopted Lutheranism, became an aggressive defender of Lutheranism, as well as other Protestant movements throughout Europe. Eventually, Finland followed the rest of Scandinavia into the Lutheran fold. This brings us to the point of introducing into the subject that we're here to study this week. Okay. Calvinism. Calvinism had its start during the period of the Reformation as well and continues to hold a critical importance today. As we mentioned, the doctrines taught in Calvinism were taught earlier than that by Augustine. But it does not become this separate, distinct movement until the time of John Calvin and under the influence of the writings of John Calvin. And that is why the name Calvinism was attached to it. Okay? It just, just didn't pop up out of nowhere. This was not a distinct movement till the time of John Calvin. And it, it has a unique importance because it was not just a theological movement. It was a political movement, as well as a theological movement. As a theological movement, there is great danger to Calvinism. We've been talking about it so far. While it has always been both a political movement, as well as a doctrinal one, political movement, as well as a doctrinal one, Calvinism's greatest influence today is in its theology. It no longer is a significant political movement really anywhere in the world. But it is still a significant doctrinal movement. However, during the time of the Reformation, Calvinism had significant influence as a political movement. Calvinism began in the mountains of Switzerland, which had long been the home of many independent churches. Prior to the introduction of Calvinism, several different groups rebelled against Roman Catholic control. Eurig Zwingli began to represent those who were willing to defy Catholicism and fight for independence. Several battles were fought, and eventually the regions of Switzerland called Canon began to exercise more and more independence. As Zwingli formed new governments, his followers established a new reformed state church. In the beginning of this, Zwingli is allied with the various Baptists in the Swiss mountains because they want to break the power of Catholicism and Zwingli wants to break the power of Catholicism. When the power of Catholicism is broken, the Baptists want to replace it with some measure of freedom and Zwingli wants to replace it with a different state church. Several battles were fought. 
As Zwingli helped form new governments, his followers established a new Reformed State Church. However, the new state church persecuted the independent churches even more viciously than the Roman Catholics had. Zwingli who is a preacher of the gospel, and if you read his sermons, shows an understanding of the gospel that would make you believe he's a brother in Christ, actually leads the way in putting his brothers in Christ to death because of his misunderstanding of doctrine. See, doctrine's not a little thing. He misunderstood doctrine to the point that it made him a murderer of his brothers and sisters in Christ. During one of the last battles with the Catholic armies, Zwingli was wounded and taken prisoner. He was then drawn and quartered. This was a horrible death, but Zwingli's legs and arms were each tied to a separate horse, and the four riders then rode rode in opposing uh, direction, literally pulling his body into four pieces. It's a terrible way to die. Such was the death of a professing Christian who had put other professing Christians to death. So people say, you don't think Zwingli could have done something that terrible and been saved? Yes, I do. I think Christian people can make terrible mistakes. I do not believe in the preservation of the saints. I think Zwingli was a saved man. But I also think saved people reap what they sow in this life. And as he, in terrible fashion, was part of putting brothers and sisters to death, he reaped what he sowed in his own death. I'm not questioning his salvation. A French Bible teacher named John Calvin became very influential in Switzerland. He eventually became the leader of Geneva. Calvin was a brilliant thinker and writer. He weaved the ideas of justification by faith, predestination of some people to heaven and hell, and the idea of a reformed state church and a harmonious system. I am not saying that as a compliment. Okay? Yes, justification by faith, that's true. The rest of this was not true. He weaved the idea of salvation by faith into a system full of heretical ideas. Although his writings indicate the work of a brilliant man, his system was solely based on human logic, not a thoughtful study of scriptures. Again, when we made this point earlier, here's a man who's training is as a Catholic priest and as a lawyer. That's what he brings to the development of his theological system. Calvin's two volumes, Institutes of the Christian Religion, became one of the most important influential works ever written. And when I wrote that, I've I've got to stop and admit, it's even more than that. It is the most influential doctrines book ever written. It's been in print continuously for 500 years. There have been more copies of it than any other doctrine's book. Like it or dislike it, and I dislike it, I said there's sections of it that are worthy, but uh, sections of it that are horrible. I've read all 2,000 pages. It is the most influential doctrine's book ever written. There's just no question about that. It's influenced the lives and thinking of more people than any other doctrines book. That doesn't make it right, or anything in it right. It means it was popular. No question it was popular. So popular, we're still dealing with it 500 years later now. Okay. Unfortunately, Calvin did nothing to stop the persecution of independent churches and preachers and even participated in it. Some have defended Calvin by claiming he did not understand what independents were trying to accomplish. However, Calvin was married to the widow of a Baptist preacher. Do you think she understood Baptists? However, Calvin was married to the widow of a Baptist preacher 
who had been killed under persecution. Surely he had adequate exposure to the purpose and intents of the independent churches. Meanwhile, all over Europe, Calvin's writings and teachings influenced Reformation groups. Now, we've addressed this some. We're going to address it a little bit more right here and some more yet before we're done. The question, why was it so popular? It is the nature of human beings not to exist in a vacuum. Okay, everybody quiet and focused? Okay. It is the nature of human beings not to exist in a vacuum. They're going to be influenced by something. When there's no good doctrinal book, they're going to take the closest they get. I will say to you, I certainly know people disagree. I would say to you one reason Calvinism is on yet another focus of flourishing is that we have been very shallow in our independent Baptist circles, not dealing with and providing all that needed to be provided. People are going to respond to something. They're going to be attracted to something. And we have not provided everything that we should. In France, the Calvinists became the most influential non-Catholic or Protestant group. They, there, they were called Huguenots, became an important part of political life. Sometimes they were persecuted, at other times they found favor with certain French kings. It's in this period and struggle that the three musketeer stories are based. Most people have no idea of this. The stories portray the Huguenots as horrible villains whom the three musketeers are fighting against. And most people, they don't know what a Huguenot is. The Huguenots were evangelical Calvinist Christians. That's why they were such terrible villains. The three musketeers were loyal Catholics. When you understand that, it sort of changes your perspective on those famous stories. While the three musketeers are portrayed as the heroes, they were actually fighting against people who believed in salvation by faith rather than by salvation in the Catholic Church. In Holland, a strong Calvinist group developed as well as a number of Baptist and Mennonite churches. The Arminian movement also developed in Holland. Soon, non-Catholics and independents were in the majority in Holland. For decades, the people of Holland fought Catholic armies, primarily from Spain, for their freedom. Eventually, under the rule of William the Silent, his son Maurice, and his son William of Orange, they achieved independence. Even though the ruling family was Calvinist, the Dutch government did not persecute independent churches. Holland soon became the freest nation in Europe. Again, under the principle, credit where credit's due, blame where blame's due. Often in telling the story, there's a lot of focus on the fact that some of the Calvinists were vicious persecutors. Some of them were. The Calvinists in Holland were not. That's just the record. I'm not defending Calvinism, but, but the, the truth is what it is. And the, there were a number of Calvinist groups and leaders in Holland who were not persecutors. So credit where credit's due. But at the same time, blame where blame is due. We'll have a later chapter on John Calvin and his involvement with religious liberty. Hey? Well, Holland soon became the freest nation in Europe. Later it was Holland's freedom which offered sanctuary to those pilgrims who would eventually sail to Massachusetts and start the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Although Calvinist and Lutheran groups became very strong in Eastern European nations, Roman Catholicism soon claimed, reclaimed full control. <clears throat> Excuse me. Assume claim full control over these countries. The political power of Roman Catholicism continues in Spain, Italy, Portugal, and Belgium and Luxembourg, in spite of a great number who rejected the church. That power continues there to this day. Calvinists, led by John Knox, however, seize control of Scotland. Okay, now to the reason we're having this history lesson. Do we consider ourselves reformed? Are we part of the Reformation? 
is it a good idea for Baptist churches to identify with Reformed theology? And I've been asked a number of times, are you Reformed? The answer, absolutely not. I'm willing to give credit where credit is due. But I'm absolutely not Reformed. Right? Let's talk about the legacy of the Reformation. The Reformation was incomplete because it did not emphasize religious liberty. There were, though, enough good results from this period of the Reformation. There were, though, good results. While the Enlightenment taught people to depend on themselves during the Reformation, many people learned to depend instead upon God. As the power and authority of the Roman Catholic Church weakened, there were many more opportunities which were open for the preaching of the gospel. Recognition was given to the scripture and the pure word of God. Literacy was increased as its people, as people developed a desire to read and understand the Bible for themselves. To read and understand the Bible for themselves. All this is positive. Anything that broke the power of the Catholic Church had a positive side to it. The Reformation also taught that there should be limits placed upon government. Hallelujah for that. The Reformation emphasized the authority of Scripture and the pure text of the Word of God. The leaders of the Reformation understood there were two different families. Uh, of text, sorry. We understood there were two different, I had a repeat of a sentence there, two different texts, uh, families of manuscripts. They understood one had been corrupted and they believed by the Catholic Church and one was uncorrupted. As a result, the reformers produced an Italian Bible, a French Bible, Spanish Bible, and the King James Bible operating on good principles of understanding the text and the transmission of the text. To this day, the Italian Bible produced during the Reformation period of uh, time remains in use by Italian Bible believers. To this day, there's a French Bible produced in the Reformation being used by many French believers and trusted as a pure word of God. There's a French equivalent in a bystander version that some use but those who understand this issue are using a French Bible that was produced during this time frame. The Osterwald revision was developed by Calvin's cousin under the pen name of Oliveton. This revision continues to be used among those who emphasize the pure text of the Word of God. Soon independent churches were using translations of the Bible which had been produced by the Reformers. And the ultimate example, in English, the Reformation produces the King James Bible, which continues to be used among people who understand the textual issue in English. Okay. Is this an accomplishment? Sure it is. <clears throat> Literacy became a priority during the Reformation as people desired to read the Bible for themselves. This distinct characteristic of Bible believers is evident as well at the time of the founding of the United States. Records state that a remarkable 98% of the male population and 50% of the female population could read in the United States during that time. Such percentages then were absolutely unheard of anywhere else in the world. Although compulsory education would not be introduced in the United States until many years later. There was a tremendous emphasis on literacy in the colonies. This was a direct response to America's Great Awakening. The Great Awakening, like the Reformation, prompted people to learn to read the Word of God and to equip their families with scriptures as well. Today, in the United States, problems of literacy have grown to a much larger than people realize. Even many professing Christians are no longer literate enough to read the Bible and study for, it for themselves. The need for literacy is one issue which has motivated the Christian school and homeschool movements. A growing Christian is doing two things. 
attending church, reading the Bible for himself. The Reformation taught limits upon government as Catholic governments were overthrown and new governments were established. John Major, a teacher of John Knox wrote, all civil authority is derived from the will of the community as a whole. The will of the community as a whole. The people have the right to choose their leaders. The Catholic Church never taught that, I promise you. A king is merely a delegate and an agent. If a king go out of bounds or misuse his power and prove incorrigible, he may rightfully be deposed and even put to death. The deposition of a king should indeed be brought out only by lawful authority and not by mere violence. But it may always be rightfully affected by the estates of the realm. During the Reformation, people began to understand there are limits on a king. A king's power is not absolute. The contrary doctrine to this is the divine right of kings. It's the divine right of kings. There's a basic belief that God chose the king, and for this reason the king's will was considered to be God's will. Psalm 149, verse 5 through 9 says, Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high priests' praises of God be in their mouths and a two-aged sword in their hand. To execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute upon them the judgment written, This honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. It actually reads there in that scripture that they had the right to study or to deal with and punish and even execute kings. Okay? And so that, that changes everything. And that's not uh, an idle thing. So we've actually said a number of good things about the Reformation. Okay. However, for all the good things we can say, they still did not believe in religious liberty. They did not believe in independent churches. They did not believe in a single one of the things we call the Baptist distinctives today. So while credit where credit's due, you want to talk about some credit? Look here in the paragraph starts out George Buchanan, who was a tutor to James I and a friend of the Bible translator Biza, was widely accounted as the most learned man in Europe. Buchanan spoke concerning this topic, expressing the almost identical doctrine. The king is a delegate and an agent and is responsible to the community. Whatever powers may have been given to the king may rightfully, for a good cause, be taken from him and resumed by the people. Limited government. The rights of the people are inalienable. A king who disregards the understanding on which he was created may be said to break an implied contract, become a tyrant, and forfeits all his rights. And this idea of limited government comes from the Reformation, but it didn't come quick enough or complete enough because they still persecuted churches. Oh, am I a reformer? No. Am I grateful for anybody that teaches the plan of salvation? I am. I'm grateful when anybody gets saved in any church. I am sensitive to this because I was not saved in a Baptist church. I am glad the gospel was preached there. There was a lot preached there that was not true. But the gospel was preached there. And I got saved under the preaching of the gospel in that church. I'm sure glad they did. I'm sure glad I found the gospel as a result of their preaching the gospel, as a result of their bus ministry. So, I am not one of those folks who tries to act like we Baptists are all there is. I am glad every time somebody preaches the gospel. 
I'm glad every time somebody gets saved. Whatever weaknesses there are in a church, if the gospel was preached there and somebody gets saved, I'm glad. Okay. But the lack of the reformers to believe in any of the Baptist distinctives, including the sole authority of the Bible, was the Bible their only authority? If it had been, they wouldn't have been discussing what human reason tells you about the gospel. The, they didn't believe in separation of church and state and religious liberty. If they had, they wouldn't have been putting people to death for refusing to belong to the state church. Do I expect to see some of the reformers in heaven? Absolutely. Am I glad they'll be in heaven? Sure thing. One of our later chapters is entitled, Was Calvin a Calvinist? Because some people have questioned that even John Calvin didn't believe these things. Uh, I'll give you a heads up, he did. But I don't think John Calvin's a Calvinist now. I think he was a saved man. And I think in heaven, the truth, uh, the glory of the gospel enfolded upon him greater than he ever understood it on the earth. And there's a gospel for the whole world. So in answer to the question I get every now and then, was Calvin a Calvinist? Yes. But ask me if he still is. Because I don't think he still is. Okay. Am I a reformer? Absolutely not. Why would a Baptist want to be, label themselves as a reformer and identify with the Reformation? So, well, they preach the gospel. Wonderful. We were doing that in our Baptist churches before you tried to make them reformed Baptists. So well, they believed in the right text of Scripture. That's a good thing. We were doing that before anybody was talking about Reformed Baptists. See? Okay, they, came, they did brought some good things out of Catholicism. But these guys running around calling themselves Reformed today didn't bring anything out of Catholicism. They're bringing it out of the Baptist churches. What would be the point? of identifying yourself with the Reformation. Okay? And I will tell you, I have more respect for the Reformers for all their mistakes. I'm not gonna finish that last little bit there for time's sake. I wanna move on uh, to the next, for the next session. We'll take our break in just a moment. But I have more respect for the Reformers because they started in ignorance and they got a little better. Not as much better as I wish they had, but they moved from a position of ignorance to understanding some things. It was a move forward. I'm afraid this movement today of folks who want to call themselves reformed are doing just the opposite. They're moving from a proper position backwards. Again, we've talked a little bit about the reasons. We'll talk more about it. I would not identify myself as a reformer. I agree with certain social principles of the Catholic Church. I agree with their opposition to abortion. I agree with their opposition to homosexuality. Would I call myself a Catholic because of that? I absolutely would not. I'll give them credit where credit's due. But I'm not about to call myself a Roman Catholic because they got some things right. I'm not about to identify with the Reformation that put my for, the forerunners of my Baptist faith to death because the leaders of the Reformation were afraid to give up the idea of the state church. They're saved, and I believe many of them were. I'm glad they're in heaven today. I rejoice in that. I expect one day to have good fellowship with John Calvin in heaven. I think we'll, we'll, we'll sit around there and laugh about this class. He'll probably say, good job. But I would never 
identify with the Reformation as a movement because I believe it would be a terrible step backwards. Let's take a 10-minute break, coming back together at 10 minutes after 2. <laughs>